Saskatoon, yeah. So let's go back to the beginning. 80s, flock of seagulls are playing. <laughs> Hairspray is the industry. You go, you know what? I want to start making instruments. So was that your first entrepreneur kind of drive? Is that how you started? No, I started with skateboards actually. Skateboards? Yeah. Didn't and see that coming. And it came from a house with no tools, so I was the odd kid out and, you know, I wanted a jigsaw for Christmas. And it started with that. And I remember using a sidewalk, because I didn't have sandpaper. I used a sidewalk to sand my skateboard. Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. <laughs> Where our sidewalks are sandpaper. That's right. So, you know, it started with... I'm a do-it-yourselfer. I'm not an entrepreneur as much as I'm a do-it-yourselfer and anything that I feel passionate about eventually, and I'm sure like everybody else, you eventually find ways of, geez, you know, it could be better if they would have only done this or thought of this. And, and uh, so with guitars, that was something I was passionate about. And from about 12 years old, I had ideas for designs and, and at 16, I sent letters out to Fender and Gibson and Ibanez saying, hey, you know, I, I've got guitar designs, you know, do you want to hire me? Thinking that, yeah, of course, these yeah, guys course want a 16-year-old kid to <laughs> draw guitars for them. And, uh, and now I have 16-year-old 16 16 kids sending me the same kind of thing. So That's cool. I remember what it was like, so I always let them down easily and go, thank you very much. <laughs> that's, that's the most amazing design I've ever seen. You've got a, you've got a great future ahead of you. Um, so that's how I got started. So you started making guitars, not basses, right? I actually started making bridges for guitars, which would be this component here. Can you see getting the 400 people on this side? See? <laughs> <laughs> so couldn't afford um, a fancy new bridge, and had only seen a postage, size, a postage stamp size photo of one in a magazine. So I had no idea how they were built, but, uh, uh, and I had no experience with metal. But uh, that was a good thing, because I didn't know how crazy it was to actually take this project on. <laughs> and so ignorance is, ignorance is a good thing. Um, and uh, inspiration is the, is the core of everything. Yeah. So now you, you talked about, you, you mentioned innovation. Now you look at that guitar, and I think most people that aren't musically inclined can look at that guitar and kind of look at it and go, that looks beautiful. Whatever that thing is, the wood is beautiful. Now this bass, oh, I just wrecked your welcome, your thank you gift, Sheldon. <laughs> thank God Shaw doesn't go down that far. I just <laughs> mozzled off to here. That's fine. So if you can see this bass, for those of you, the innovation comes in, it's, it's a fan fret. So if you look at the guitar, I mean, there's more to it than just the fan fret. We'll sure. get into that. But the regular guitar, which it's always been, is just that block, systematic. The, the frets are all parallel to each other. The strings are all the same length from here to here. They call that the speaking length. It's what you hear when it vibrates. OK. Speaking length. My wife wishes she could adjust my speaking length. <laughs> as easy as your guitar. So this fan fret bass comes out. and. I was uh, the typical pastor's kid that was forced to play piano and you, you look at the piano inside and you see long strings and short strings and things. 
hit the short ones, and the short ones sound brighter than the long ones. That's about my tech, techno, like technological sure. expertise. That sounds different than that, I can see it. So you come, and you're not the first person that's done the fan fret. No. But in, in the music industry now, you're kind of the main fan fret kind of bass. You know, without, in business terms, we created a niche market of fan fret basses in which we dominate. We're the world's largest manufacturer of fan fret instruments. But it's a... Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 honestly, I, I know, that, and I was saying this to you before, if you don't know the music industry, you have no idea who's sitting here. Like, this is a big deal. Like, if you went to the Juno, <laughs> if you went to the Junos a couple years ago, I'd, you, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be driving the limos. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm that guy. Yeah, yeah. And I'll sell you a bass. Where are you going to? Do you play bass? But anyway, I'm, I'm serious. This is a big deal. He's got, and we'll get into the story of who's playing your basses and what albums they're on because that, that's where people will click probably later. Those guys? Yeah. But this is a big deal. And it started in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And it started, it, did it start in your house? How did you start this? You went from building bridges to what? to uh, building some prototype guitars just for myself. Okay. And I couldn't decide on which one I wanted, so I built three. And uh, borrowed my uncle's garage to be able to do this because I had no tools. Uh, but my business actually started on a, on a kitchen table. And um, it grew to the basement of HGL Music and still my uncle's borrowed garage. And then eventually I moved to my own shop in the Uncle Ed's building, which turned out to be not a good idea. Yeah, 19, we were, and we'll talk about that a bit, so don't give too much away, because okay. I got, that's coming up. Hold on tight, fans. There's something suspenseful coming up. So go into Ed's music. So then something happened, but then what else happened? Yeah, so then, so then that all, that all got hot and, 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 and then, <laughs> yeah, and then disappeared. And, yeah. and the next day I was shopping for pencils, literally. And that was the hardest decision of my life at that one point was, should I buy this pencil or this one? And I, lit I couldn't make up my mind. I actually walked out of Staples without a pencil because <laughs> the, the decision was just at that point in my life was the most important decision I could possibly make because this was what I was going to rebuild my entire life with, was this pencil. Um, and so that day I walked out without one. I went back the next day and bought a pencil. So. The part that you're missing is, so if you weren't from Saskatoon like me, 1996, Ed's music burns down. And it's a terrible fire. Literally, you were saying, like, firemen are out running bricks. They're falling from the building after the explosion because there's a natural gas line that's feeding the city hospital, right? Feeding city hospital, yeah. So that kind of compounded explosion. Sheldon's buying pencils. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a huge fire, and, and, and that's uh, something that is a common theme with all of our entrepreneurs, and, and it's not that there's like other businesses burned down. That's not the common theme. The common theme is that there's this real risk. It's, it, it's an inherent risk when you own your own business. And you face that. You, you, you actually didn't just face the risk. You got the end of the stick. Like You're building burnt down. You're starting all over. So how did that, how, how did you rebuild this business? You're just starting. How did you rebuild it? You know, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't really even want to get back into business, um, but the, it gets in your blood. Building guitars especially, because I'm passionate about it, and it's probably the only thing I'm good at. There's, there's man, there's a list as long as my arm that, of things that I'm not good at, <laughs> and there's a list as, as long as this that I am good at, and they all apply to building guitars. So, I, I'm not sure I had a choice in the matter, and uh, my friend Glenn McDougall, he would have no part of it. He says, you know, we're, you're getting back to business. There's no way that you're not, we're going to get you through this. And so I had, I had help from the musicians community. I had help from, uh, from Glenn, who's the father of the Canadian electric guitar, um, and another guy named Byron Olson. So the three of us got together, and um, they, they pulled me through. You know, I, I, I was along for the ride, so to speak. Well, and you kind of like Seinfeld, yada yada, over a, ma a major part of that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Greg, you father of guitars. 
Saskatoon, you guys might not know this, but there's also an electric guitar manufacturer from Saskatoon who was the first electric guitar manufacturer in Canada. So he's like the Les Paul, if you've heard of Les Paul, Gibson guitars. He's, honest to God, he's the Les Paul of Canada. And it's from Saskatoon. Yeah. It's, it's a crazy story. Well, you know, if you look into, if you look into uh, manufacturing um, philosophies, there are names that, that crop up. Um, uh, Edward Demings, the, the father of uh, lean manufacturing and the Toyota method. Uh, Glenn McDougall's been doing this kind of stuff on his own since the 60s. I mean, he just came up with all these really um, modern manufacturing methods way before G General Motors did and Ford did. I mean, if they would have hired him, they could have been 20 years ahead of the curve. Yeah. This is a guy that, at 13 years old, was drawing uh, three-dimensional drawings of carburetors. Uh, I, I, I remember being 13 and, and I couldn't even draw a straight line. <laughs> yeah. I still can't. Yeah. You don't have to. You know, curves like this. So you talked a little bit now about the manufacturing process. So this guy's burns down. Your friends have encouraged you to get back into it. Yes. At that point, are you a solo? Like you're the only staff member that you have to worry about? Yeah, at that point, um, I'd given up my repair business and uh, given it to one of my employees. And uh, I was a one-man shop, so um, I was back to starting over from scratch again. And I made up my mind, you know, if I'm going to start this over again, I'm going to make the first base that I build the best base I've ever built. And that was my goal. And, um, and uh, it was, actually. So is that where the fan fret came from? No, the first base? Were you already doing fan frets? We were already doing fan frets. Um, and they, they took off. Okay. And it's interesting, I used to work for Brad Laidlaw over at Earl's. And uh, that's when I was starting my career as a guitar builder. I was working at Earl's. And he said, you know what? Uh, you'll know when you're doing the right thing because people will come to you. You don't have to go out there and, and, um, and you know, express your, your, uh, what you're doing. If you've hit something, it'll resonate with people and they'll come to you. I've seen that over and over and over again. Um, whenever you're on the right track, there'll be this resonance and people will just like respond and your phone will start ringing. And if you're on the wrong track, well, they won't. <laughs> and your phone will be silent. Well, you, and, and you, we kind of talked earlier about the, the wrong track. So there, I, my first, in interaction with the wall bases, and I was saying this before, was when a friend of mine ordered one from Regina. I was playing in a band in Regina, our bass player was like a karate guy and nerdy, but he was a brilliant bass player. He's like, man, I just ordered this Dingwall bass from Saskatoon. I'm like, well, what a, what a, what a, that's fair. A bass, sounds cool. And I remember he brought it to the first practice, and it was in this like dungy Victorian basement, like, seven foot walls, we had our PA system and we just played for like three hours and he was all over this thing, like loving every minute of it. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, it looks different. Okay, what's going on? So tell us the fan fret. It's patented, then it became a public patent, a public domain. Explain what this fan fret does. Not, I mean, it looks cool and it's, from a sales perspective, it, look, it looks different, buy this. But what's, what's the science behind it? It's, it's actually centuries old. Um, we're basically taking the two separate musical uh, stringed instrument families, pianos, harps, and combining them, mashing them together with violins and guitars and, and instruments that have come from that line, where it's a single scale, like here's a guitar over here, uh, mentioned that each string is the same length, same speaking length, but that's it's actually quite limiting in terms of what this guitar can do. And combining it with the pianos and harps, where the lower strings are longer, the, sh the treble strings are shorter. And just squishing them together and, and using computer technology to lay out the frets so that that all works. And now we've come up with something that's a hybrid of the two. And with the newer music that's come along, this technology is actually perfectly suited for some of these new modern musics where the tuning on basses is extremely low and the technology has not been there. We've been around for 26 years and all of a sudden these new kids 
are discovering us and going, yeah, this is this is what we've been looking for all along. Well, because I'm I'm like a musical connoisseur and I know everything about music. A lot of like I like I remember when this <laughs> I shouldn't even admit this actually as a Pearl Jam fan. But I remember when Boys to Men's album came out in like 1991, like the the river. That, what was that? Does anyone remember that song? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you guys see some of the guys. They're like, yeah, I played that for my girlfriend in the basement. <laughs> Didn't turn out well, but I was pictured great things. You know, it, lots of that kind of stuff. The bass was actually a keyboard because they're hitting those low notes and, yeah. and that stuff. It was so, a dark period back then. <laughs> it was a dark period. So <laughs> 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 I, did, I, you know what? In junior high school, I did make out with a girl to that album. It was fantastic. <laughs> Kyla Warnicky. So that's a very name. <laughs> that's a very name. Her husband is way bigger than me, and he's an awesome guy. Why is your cell phone ringing right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> My wife is watching this feed. Anyway, so what used to what used to have to be done on a keyboard to get those like those tones and those sounds, you developed. You're putting it in a bass now. As a matter of fact, yeah. Bass players were losing studio gigs to keyboard players because it could just be done with their left hand on yeah. and, um, and it would sound good. And um, so right around when we came out, uh, the first people to, to jump onto what we were doing were studio players. Yeah, okay. And they pulled gigs back into the bass world. Which is cool. We've all heard that sick bass line, the boom. So now the bass guys are doing that. You've got this niche, as you said. Is it just instant success and gold because you've got this niche? You're able to say, hey, look, we're going to get you jobs back. How does that work? Well, yes and no. It did resonate, and, and it resonated more than the guitars. I'm a guitar player. I'm not a bass player. If I had my choice, I would probably build guitars. But that's not what the market wanted from us. The market wanted basses from us. And so that's what we're known for. That's what we do. This is what I this is what I built for myself, and we've built in the last ten years six of these. And this is this is mine because we couldn't sell it. Um, <laughs> what's that? How much is it worth? Uh, a guitar like this would probably be forty five hundred dollars. Um, Perfect. That's a fair price if you don't understand. Good guitars, that's a great place. Yeah, I mean, you can walk into Lonnie McQuaid Music and buy a guitar for $99. Yeah. And almost 98% of the guitar market is under $1,000. Our lowest price instrument starts at $1,200. So we are competing for 2% of the market. Um, and and our average ticket is in about the 5000 range, and our, our top end line would be $12,000. Uh, so we're really, we're really positioned at the very top end of the market, but that's kind of where we have to be if you're going to be a small player, because Fender, Gibson, Ibanez, um, they're all duping it out for the under thousand market. And at that point, it's scale, right? It's scale. You know, they're 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 making ten bucks a guitar. Yeah. And uh, they can do it because they have the infrastructure, they have the distribution network, they have the manufacturing. We have none of that. Um, we don't build an instrument until it's ordered. So we have to find somebody every single day that's got a wallet big enough that can afford one of our instruments and has enough faith and trust in our brand that they will plunk down a deposit on something that they can't even touch. Yeah, exactly. Versus going into a music store and going, oh, I like that. Okay, I'll buy it. Um, they, everything, all of our customers base their purchase completely on faith. Have you ever thought about kind of selling in that mass production and getting into the, into the, the chains like Long McQuaid's and stuff? Yeah, it's, it, the uh, retailers have all the power. Okay. Um, and so we are in Long McQuaid, we're in a couple of their stores, um, but really we're not there. Like I say, we, we uh, would, um, our target market, our, our core market is enthusiasts that typically don't shop at the Long McQuaid's. And so there's a bit of a mismatch there. Um, they love us because, they, you know, they, they, 
their bread and butter would be the major brands, and I'll, I won't mention names, but they're the the uh, everyday brands. Yep. And when our stuff comes in, it's like, wow, this is something we can really get behind. It's new, it's fresh, it's exciting. Um, our customers, when they buy it, like they, they come back and they're like, oh man, I, I love, you know, there's so much passion for what we do. Um, but uh, it's not a mass market item by any stretch of the imagination.